Good morning everyone, welcome to our small footprint. My name is Nissa, and if you're new here, we are a family of eight who live off grid in Australia. Today's video is one that's been heavily requested. It is to do with starting a new sourdough starter. Uh, now, I have sort of put off making the video because there's a lot of people who've made videos about starters around there and probably some that are far more knowledgeable than me about it. All my sourdough skills are purely from doing it, obviously, and so that reflects in the way that I use it. Uh, I use what I do what does best for me rather than strictly following any sort of principles. So what I did was I started a new starter from scratch and I have some comparison shots between the new starter and the old starter and we did a bake at the end to compare the difference between the two bakes so there was some issues with that as well but I didn't see the point in doing a fresh one. It's better to show you what I got done and how it worked and the you know that sort of thing. So but as all my videos are done with a bit of a voiceover rather than in person, it makes it a little more difficult to explain some of the steps. So when I make my videos, what I tend to do is I tend to do a whole lot of filming and then I just put all that uh, footage into, I just use iMovie on my laptop and I put all the footage there and then I write notes. So I go through all the footage and I write out notes of exactly what is going on in the video and some timestamps. And then I come out here to underneath the solar structure because it's one of the only places where the children's noise is a little bit distant uh, and the dogs, though sometimes I still have to stop for the dogs. And I use my notes to create a voiceover for the video. And then once I've done that, I take it inside and I upload the voiceover footage to the computer and then I have to sit there and sync the footage with the voiceover so that it works. So... Uh, I'm pretty good at doing it now because it's the way I've been doing it for over 12 months because I just found that it was the easiest way for me to do it and I like to do my voiceovers talking to the camera because I find that that way if there's some little gaps I can show footage of me talking to the camera anyway but I do find that it becomes more expressive and com conversational for me to do that rather than trying to talk just to a microphone uh, but I don't like doing it with the footage in front of me either because it tends to be a bit stilted so I found that this is the way that works the best <laughs> but it's also somewhat time consuming and sometimes doesn't quite work because I don't like to come out and redo any voice either because if I'm putting that in between the other things it, it ruins the flow of it so you'll have to bear with me but this is how I do all my videos so hopefully anyone who's requested it knows that that's how it's going to work and that hopefully we can get it all across so this was starting a starter from day one to day I think it was day seven or eight that I baked a loaf uh, and the all the processes in between and things like that so I hope it helps some people who were interested in seeing it and I that it inspires some people to actually give it a go it's really not as hard as sometimes it it is put across as and of course I make plenty of sourdough stuff all the time so that will continue to be put on the channel here and I'll continue to feed that new starter and increase the growth of it as well and the strength of it too. So here we go, let's see if it all comes together like it should. So sourdough starters are basically just flour and water and what they do is they attract the wild yeasts in the air and the bacteria in the air and they create their own little biome within that flour and water and then once that biome is there every time you feed it you're giving it more uh, food sources and so it grows and grows and then once it runs out of food it falls so the idea is that you're feeding it something it eats and while it eats it 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 charges up and then once it's eaten all the food it falls again so you have to create enough of a bacteria colony in there for it to do that so initially you're not going to see a whole lot so this is day one and I've put 50 grams of water and 50 grams of flour in a jar and mixed it well flour wise I just use the cheap baker's flour from Costco uh, a lot of people use whole wheat flours and spelts and things like that and they say they have a real lot of good results using those whole wheat flours and things like that but for us the amount of starter I use and the cost and all the rest of it the the baker's flour is what we use because that's what I tend to bake with as well I use spelt flour in a lot of things but I just use it as a small portion so I don't see the point in feeding it to my starter uh, and my starter is pretty strong anyway so I don't see any need to change the flour the baker's flour from Costco seems to work perfectly for me water 
best option is filtered water because it's not going to have any chlorine or anything in it so rain water or filtered water we use water from the Berkey for ours because it's nice clean water and I know that there's no contaminants in it so that works for me so you just want to mix the 50 grams of water 50 grams of flour into the jar and you want to leave it go so what I'm, I'm going to feed my my current strong starter at the same time so we can have a look at some car comparisons uh, so my starter I actually feed in 100 150 gram increments so I did 100 grams of flour and 100 grams of uh, water and part of that is the strength of the starter that you're leaving behind but also the quantity of the starter that you leave behind in the jar uh, the more starter you're leaving behind in the jar the more food it's going to require so if you've got if you've scraped your jar down to nothing then 50 grams of 50 grams is probably fine but at the same time I tend to bake two loaves of bread at a time which will use 200 odd grams of starter which means that whatever's left behind is enough that like I do two, two 100 gram loaves and then there's still scrapings behind to feed again so I'm going to put the jars on the bench I use fabric over the top of them so you want something that breathes uh, I don't use some people use uh, like glass lids that don't seal all the way but we get fruit flies and all sorts of things in ours if I do that so I use a cloth with a rubber band a nice tight weave cloth not even uh, cheesecloth because cheesecloth the little fruit flies would still get through so the uh, nice tight uh, jersey knit is what I use and I've got two different colored prints here so that I know which jar is which uh, this and then this is the nighttime showing of these two starters so the first starter the new starter has done pretty much nothing which is to be expected but the uh, old starter the more the starter with more strength to it has completely doubled or tripled so what I do with that one is I stick it in the fridge so at peak I stick it in the fridge and that way when I want to use it I just use it straight out of the fridge at that point so I'm going to put the old starter in the fridge and then the new starter I'll just leave on the bench to continue doing its thing overnight you can do these twice a day like 12 hourly feed them 12 hourly but that I would never have remembered so most of this stuff is done every 24 hours uh, and it shows because you'll see as I go along that sometimes it peaks and falls before I feed it again ideally you're going to do it more regularly but it depends on your weather like if it's cold then it's not going to peak as quickly if it's hot it's going to peak more more quickly and just time every 12 hours it's, it's just a little bit too much for me so uh, I did this as on a day by day basis so day two uh, the, this is the jar of the next morning so it's approximately 24 hours now you can discard some of this and refeed it but I decided not to discard it it is really warm at my place at the moment and so it can handle having a significant amount so I just put 50 grams of starter and 50 grams of water into the jar mixed it well and scraped it down now you want to scrape down the side so that you can see what if there's any movement in your starter I don't expect there to be any in this particular 24 hour period either it shouldn't it, there might be some bubbles in it but it was not going to do a whole lot you can feed it heavier it's going to take longer starter is one of those things it's your starter is basically just a loaf of bread that is or or you can look at it as a loaf of bread is a starter it's just a different size so you're waiting for the bacteria in that starter to populate the whole loaf so the more flour and water you put in there the longer it's going to take for that bacteria to populate that flour and water or eat it or consume it or however you want to put it uh, and the less you put in there the less time so if you're working on a timeline you can learn by your temperature how quickly how many hours before you want to use it that you will feed your starter and what quantities day three is so this is the next day on day three there's definitely some activity in there like there's a smattering of bubbles all the way through but there's not much sort of a a rise in volume uh, there's an aerated texture in it but it's really thin there's no structure to it no strength to the liquid it's just a really sort of aerated thin liquid that hasn't really grown much at all it just is showing that there is some activity within the product uh, which is good you want to start seeing that uh, but it's it's still not really doing anything as such yet so I pulled out or discarded though I don't really like the term discard because I never discard anything I never throw anything away it's just flour and water whether it's got a leavening agent to it or not it's still just flour and water so it's still usable in any dish you would make so I pulled out about 150 grams of the 
starter, leaving approximately 50 grams behind and feeding at 50 grams and 50 grams, which is called a 1-1-1 feeding. Uh, so I mixed it well uh, and scraped down the sides as per usual and then used an elastic to mark where it was because I expect that by tomorrow this will actually have a bit of rise to it. So if I put an elastic band around where the starter is currently sitting then tomorrow I'll be able to see where it rises to and what height we get out of it and whether we're getting a doubling or, or whatever else out of it. So I put that uh, elastic band around the jar at the level so that I can see what it's doing and I can assess the quality of it uh, and where it's at and that make sure it's progressing and things like that. Uh, it's fairly unimportant at the moment obviously because you can just see whether it's doing anything or not and we're not planning on using it anytime soon. It'll be quite a few days before we use it. Some starters do have a bit of a pause about day three or four. They look like they might double day three and then day four do nothing. Uh, mine didn't this time so I haven't got it to show you but sometimes that happens and you just need to keep feeding through it. Uh, I'm not entirely sure why, but a lot of people have that issue. You get to sort of day four, day three it doubled, day four it does nothing, day five it does nothing, then day six it works again. So you just need to push through those first, those few days. You want to give yourself a 10 day sort of a span. I did seven I think for this because my starter didn't have that pause, but about a 10 day period for that. Uh, so one of the things that I use uh, for the discard as such is any sort of recipe that doesn't really rely on the starter for leavening as I said so you can make a whole bunch of things that don't require lift in the recipe so you're using the starter because it's flour and water and it's tasty and things like that but it, you're not relying on it for lift so one of the things we did today one of the recipes that we use this sort of thing for is like if I've got a starter that's fallen and I've got too much and I want to feed it again before I use it or whatever else uh, is something like crepes. So I used the I used the recipe and I used whatever the discard was and I think I used a bit of my normal starter as well because it didn't have quite enough and we made crepes. Uh, the crepe recipe that I use is a variation of Farmhouse on Boone I think and it has like, I don't know, 10 eggs and a cup of starter and a little bit of melted butter, a little bit of salt and a bit of milk and comes to a consistency of like a thick cream. You want it fairly thin because you're going to spread it out on the pan. Uh, and I use about, a, I suppose, a half a cup per per pan uh, and swirl it around and then flip it and cook it. They they don't always flip very nicely, but it doesn't matter. The kids don't care if they're all sort of torn up in pieces. They'll eat it regardless. Uh, we also find that the recipe doesn't make a huge amount. So it's sort of only a part of a meal. It's not a whole meal for the amount of effort that it takes. So I don't make them that often, but we do really enjoy them when I do. And today we made them and served them with some of the Korean lemon chung syrup that I had in the fridge from all those... Uh, lemon pieces that I had macerated in sugar so it was really tasty uh, but yeah it doesn't make a particularly huge meal for our size family but it uses up lots of eggs which is great and it uses up that starter without having any issues it just adds a nice tang to the dough but it doesn't need to to lift so it works well for that okay on day four now I'm going to I've been very careful not to cross contaminate these at the same time that I've always used different utensils in both jars to make sure that I'm not causing any cross contamination between the starters so we're getting a real view of the new one that's fresh it doesn't have any of the old starter going in it is very warm at the moment so again as I said the the heat the ambient temperature is really going to impact your starter because it's it's basically a dough. So when you're proofing a dough and you're proofing it at uh, 20 degrees Celsius, then it might take eight hours, eight to 10 hours overnight. But when it's 28 degrees, it only takes six-ish hours to get to, to double sort of thing. So the warmer it is, the quicker your starter is going to hit whatever its peak is at whatever point you're at and then fall again. So you have to be aware of that at the time. Uh, so this starter has actually peaked and fallen overnight you can see that it's doubled because of the line where you can see where the starter has gone up and then it's fallen back down and then it's fallen back down to the starting point so it's doubled overnight but it's doubled and then fallen before I get to it so again realistically if I was being really pedantic about it which isn't really my thing uh, then I could have fed it again last night before I went to bed and it probably would have been a peak in the morning but I'm not using it for anything specific at the moment so it doesn't really matter if it peaks and falls and you can see it still shows you that the that there was a peak and that you can see that line on the jar and then then it fell so it still lets you see the the process of how it's going to to do 
uh, the I discarded most of it and then I fed it 100 grams of starter, 100, uh, 100 grams of flour and 100 grams of water because obviously the heat is a bit high at the moment and it's uh, it's not getting fed enough to last 24 hours in the temperatures that we have. So mix and scrape and move the elastic band according to the to the uh, jar like where it's sitting because it's sitting a bit higher at starting point now because I added a bit more flour and water to this particular one. I also fed the main starter as well. So this was about 7.30 in the morning that I was doing this. So I fed the main starter as well. Obviously I needed to. I don't recall what I made, but I did. Uh, so I fed them both and discarded, pulled the discard into a jar as needed. Then I want to show you at, so about four and a half hours later, this is around about midday, you, the new one has tripled and the old one has quadrupled so you can see what the temperatures here are doing to it at the moment we've got in only what four and a half hours the new one has tripled its volume and the old one has quadrupled its volume which is pretty standard for mine mine sort of quadruples uh in a standard sort of a period of time and that's when i toss it in the fridge but the new one's showing heaps of activity too with a triple in four and a half hours they say that once your starter doubles or triples in four to six hours then it's ready to use uh, I, I'd be hesitant to say on a day four that you want to bake bread with it unless you're baking something that isn't going to be an issue if it doesn't work. Like flatbreads or something like that is fine, but I wouldn't be trying to bake a loaf on day four unless you want to and you're happy to have it fail. Like you have to be happy for it to fail sort of thing. It might not, but at the same time, day four is a little early to be attempting to do a loaf. I wanted to show you what else you're looking for, not just the, the growth, not just the doubling of the starter. So they're both fed at exactly the same time and mixed with their own spatulas. The new is kind of runny. Uh, there's plenty of aeration, big bubbles, lots of, you know, um, lots of that aerated structure in the liquid, and but it's very thin and runny. Uh, the older one is quite viscous. It holds its shape. It shows its strength. It go. It's... Uh, kind of tacky and almost dough-like uh, where so it it's created its own sort of a, a dough and these are both fed the same ratios they're both 100% hydration and they're both uh, fed with the same flour same water and everything else and that's both after four and a half hours so it just that's one of the other things about a starter it's not just about the doubling it's not just about the increase in size and all that it's about the structure of the starter as well much like when you're baking dough the structure of the dough matters doesn't matter if it's proof to double and and you're trying to shape it and put in something if the structure of the dough is poor then you're not going to be able to shape it and put it in a banneton or whatever you want to put it in uh, so the structure of the starter is relevant as well when you're working out what how good your starter is and what point it's at and how how well it's going to work and things like that so that I feel like that that is part and parcel of the process of uh, of assessing your starter is similar to assessing your dough because basically they are the same things. Uh, they are just on a slightly different scale, different hydration, like your standard sort of dough, that, like a, a boule or whatever that you're making. It'd be about like a beginner's 70% hydration basically. And this starter is 100% hydration, but they're basically the same thing. Uh, and I think that's how you have to think about it with your starter as well. And it'll make more sense that way rather than thinking of it as a whole separate entity. It is 100% hydration dough, basically. And you're feeding it multiple times so that it has the ability to continue to grow as you use it. Uh, so the old one goes in the fridge at peak uh, to be used whenever I want and I use it straight out of the fridge uh, and the new one again we scrape nearly everything out and feed 100 grams of flour 100 grams of water again uh, the discard goes in the fridge until I use it so every time I discard from this I just put it in a jar and I use it over the next few days for whatever I'm making uh, and as I said anything that isn't reliant on leavening is fine uh, it will give some lift but at the same time it's I don't want to use it for something that if fails is not edible so we are aware of that when we do it on day five the new 
one has tripled and fallen again overnight so obviously it's just really really warm here at the moment so even overnight it has tripled and then fallen again and you can see it on the the jar exactly what it's done uh, and then I wanted to show you again talking about the structure of the starter a demo of the old starter even from the fridge and the texture difference uh, so the even from the fridge that it's still got those bubbles. It's still got, it still looks like it's at peak. It's like it pauses at peak. It will eventually fall, but it looks like it's pauses at peak and it still has that lovely aerated structure and that, whereas the uh, one that was left on the bench is still quite liquidy. So this was just a, a visual there of what I was trying to explain before. Discard goes into the jar as needed and fed 100 grams and 100 grams again for the for the new one uh, and then I used the discard to make some batches of pasta so again it's something that ferments slightly but it's not reliant on a lift to be edible so and we love sourdough pasta it's one of our favorite things to make it's time consuming <laughs> uh, and the amount that I need to make to feed everyone is quite high so regularly the kids don't end up eating it they just have the dried pasta which they're fine with uh, but we do really love sourdough pasta and the lack of activity in the starter is not going to be detrimental to the pasta so I made a couple of pasta batches up uh, I put uh, it's 400 grams of flour 100 grams of starter three eggs um, 60 grams of oil and a pinch of salt and then you bring it together in the thermomix or a food processor till it's all those little balls spit put it out on a tray and bring it together into a ball uh, sourdough pasta always looks a little crumbly because you're going to let it ferment which is going to make it smoother so i just wrap it up and let it ferment for a few hours and then stick it in the fridge for when i want to use it and roll it out so i'll use that in the next couple of days which is why it's great to use the discard with too because it can now sit in the fridge for a few days it's got eggs in it so you can leave it in the fridge for as long as you would leave anything that had raw egg in it sort of thing like mayos and stuff a week basically but I try and do it within a couple of days and then roll it all out and we freeze what we don't eat on day six so this is uh, the eighth and it's day six uh, we did the normal we discarded most of what was in the jar and then uh, refed it I also decided to put in a new jar here for you guys it is really for your benefit not mine I don't really care but it gives a lot better uh, imagery of the rise on it if it's in a nice clean sided jar so I transferred it into a clean jar just so that I could show you that as it starts to do its thing more we can show the structure of the dough and the rise and things like that uh, I did the I used the discard for flatbread recipe again a little bit of leavening is fine but it's not going to completely rely on that to be a success uh, my flatbread recipes are, is really simple I've mentioned it quite a few times um, and I think I may have added a sprinkle of yeast, like a quarter of a teaspoon, just to compensate for the lack of leavening. I can't remember. I'll, I'm try and remember. I'll have a look when I'm doing the adding the voiceover to the to the footage. But uh, my but my flatbread recipe is very versatile. If it's got, uh, like if I don't add any yeast to it, it's basically a tortilla dough. And if I add yeast to it, then it's more of a flatbread slash naan sort of a, a texture to it. So it really doesn't matter which way I do it. Uh, these definitely turned out sort of like really nice soft tortillas rather than flatbreads, which is perfectly fine. We use them either way and we don't care about the texture. It really doesn't matter. I suppose the flatbreads end up being more of just a fold in half taco type wrap whereas the tortillas have the ability to roll things into them uh, so we're more likely to do like the the tortilla style for breakfast burrito type things with you know scrambled eggs and bacon and things like that uh, and the flatbreads are more for like a grilled meat and coleslaw type dish I suppose if that makes sense uh, so the so then this is the starters four hours later. You can see that the new one is still fairly thin compared to the established starter, but it definitely has a bit more structure to it. And you can definitely see the aeration and that it's starting to get to the point of being usable. So because I didn't have the stall at all with my starter, I went on to use it on day seven. So on day seven, I decided to put it to the test and make standard rounds with both starters. Now I use a standard sort of a, used a standard sort of a basic recipe, a fairly low hydration 50 grams of starter 350 grams of water 500 grams of flour and 10 grams of salt and I brought it together 
did the same method didn't cross contaminate with utensils brought them both and washed my hands in between or i did the new one first and then the other one afterwards so i wasn't adding any of the uh, old starter into the new because we wanted it you know a definitive sort of a as much as a home kitchen and home outdoor kitchen uh, it could be we wanted sort of a definitive result there so we bring we roughly bring all the dough together you just want to moisten all the flour in the first sort of rough sort of bring together and then I put an elastic on the bowl that was the new starter so that we could make sure that that wasn't contaminated and we knew what it was uh, as I said making sure to wash my hands and separate the utensils and things like that I came back and stretch and fold after the autolyze so the autolyze is basically just that first smoothing of the dough so when you bring it all together it's really rough and shaggy and if you leave it for 30 minutes by the time you come back it started to be really sort of thin and silky started to get there so I did stretch and fold after the first 30 minutes and brought it all together made sure that I collected anything off the sides that needed to be collected and things like that uh, then after the next next 30 minutes I just coil folded them in the bowls very roughly uh, stretch and fold coil fold whatever you want to use just bring them together and I did that uh, again after another 30 minutes and I might have done it once or twice more I don't recall turning the camera on for anymore I don't have any footage but I try and do it two or three four times before I go to bed but realistically even if I only do it twice it's it's not too bad for this kind of a dough the more you coil it and stretch and fold and create the tension in the dough the more likely your dough is to hold its shape when you are baking it but I bake it in uh, billy cans because we're doing it in the wood stove so it's not as important for me for it to hold its shape uh, so but the more you do it the more likely it is but if you're doing it in a Dutch oven or anything like that which is how most people start out making sourdough they don't generally do it on a flat tray or anything like that then the enamel and stuff will help to hold the shape of it as well uh, but I just brought it all together did the coil folds a few times and then got it done now I leave that on my bench overnight uh, to proof and so I stop folding it or whatever at like 10 p.m. and leave it there till six sort of an eight hour span uh, and the nights have been dropping down to about 20. Now unfortunately I slept in not something I do very often but Daryl must have got up and left me in bed and I slept in so it was about 8 30 by the time I went out to the bench and normally it would be 6 37. Uh, I, so the dough had overproofed because normally I don't want it to touch the lids of those bowls normally it just domes but doesn't quite hit the lids of those bowls so it's overproofed and touch the bowls but not overproofed to be unusable just overproofed to be a little less easy to handle uh, so it's pretty sticky uh, and a little bit sloppy because of that overproofing but it's not unusable it's just not ideal it means that this uh this bread will probably have quite a close crumb there won't be any big open holes or anything because that's sort of what overproofing tends to do is you're because you have to handle it so much to get it into a shape and the overproofing factor it ends up a much tighter crumb a much uh, uh firmer bread some people really like the tighter crumb like because some people don't really like the holy bread because if it's too holy then your spreads go through and things like that so a lot of people really like the tighter crumb a bit more like a sandwich bread uh so that becomes a personal preference when you're figuring out how long you want to proof your bread and, and all and your hydration and things like that but it's fine it just was a little overproofed which is not ideal when i'm trying to do a video about it but you know that's life uh so i shaped both the loaves as best i could as i said it was a bit sticky but we created a, a tight skin on the top i have a lot more videos about actually the baking of the dough this is more just a demonstration of this starter so uh, i can go more in depth in the shaping and stuff with a better proofed bread <laughs> next time uh, but this is more just for the demonstration purposes so all i did was i folded all the corners in got a nice uh, smooth top and then you drag it towards you on the mat so that you're creating a nice tight drum sort of a top on the ball and you're tucking all the bits underneath it I put them in my version of a banneton I don't have banner like wooden bannetons because everything goes moldy here because of the humidity so I use stainless steel colanders with a tea towel uh, so I just put the tea towel inside the colander sprinkle it with some semolina and then sprinkle the top of the dough with a bit of semolina you want the the nice smooth ball down in the banneton the pinched bits on the top pinch it together if anything's coming apart a little bit of semolina down the edge tuck the tea towel over it and then put it in the fridge now the having a tea towel instead of plastic means that your dough gets a little bit of a skin which makes it easier to score 
so that's why we do that. Uh, and I use, as I said, the stainless steel colanders because I don't have, I don't, I can't use wooden ones. And I just use whatever tea towels I have. Uh, so it works for me. The goes into the fridge for a minimum of six hours. Normally I would leave it for 24, 48, to be honest. I only left it for the day today because we were having, we were going to have it with dinner, except that you'll see that we burned it slightly, but we were going to have it for dinner. Uh, so I left it for about the six hours. Now I like to cook my uh, rounds in these billy cans that I have. So these are camping billy cans and the uh, colanders are a little wide for the billy cans, but they fit. It, it works out all right. Uh, I'd like slightly smaller colanders, but finding smaller colanders hasn't been something I've managed yet. Uh, but I also haven't looked too hard. So, uh, so the, I use these colanders upside down in my barbecue as well. That's what I use to put all my trays on when I'm baking and stuff. So I have like six of them and you know, we'll, we will make do. Now the dough is, I've, so what I do is I grab a piece of baking paper and I tip the dough out onto the baking paper, take the tea towel off and then I score it. Now this dough is spreading as soon as it hits that uh, baking paper because it's that little bit overproofed, but also because it probably could have done with longer in the uh, fridge, to be honest. But we wanted to get this, <laughs> I wanted to get this video done and this comparison done, and we were going to have it for dinner. Then it's raining. So what we do is we put this dough into the billy cans using the baking paper. We score it, put it into baking, into the uh, tins with the baking paper. One of these billy cans has a handle on it, one it doesn't. That's how I differentiated the two different doughs. Uh, and we put lids on them. Cooking it in the wood stove, because that's how I like to cook my bread, which is why we're doing it in the billy cans. The problem is it's raining. Uh, it's only just started raining. Daryl had some wood for me, which was dry, and I got him to start the wood stove, but he kind of over overcompensated for the weather. So it's a little bit cold, it's a little bit wet. So he stoked the fire and he just stoked it a little high. So I put the bread in the oven and set a timer like I normally do but the timer hadn't even gone off and I could smell burn and I hadn't even taken the lids off the cans because normally I put it in the oven for about 25 minutes with the lid on and then about 25 or 35 minutes with the lid on and 10 minutes without the lid depending on the temperature it's a wood stove so it varies very much compared to a uh, temperature controlled oven type thing and uh, I could smell it burning even before I took the lids off. So I went out there, took the lid off, and it, they're very black on top. Uh, but it wasn't quite at temperature internally. Uh, so I let it go a little bit longer and then decided to call it. Uh, so I pulled them out and let them cool a bit before we cut them. So they're definitely a little charred on the outside. Uh, but I decided to, we were going to keep going with this and we were going to see how it worked. And hopefully not have to redo the, I will redo this demonstration at some point purely because I have two starters now so I can do the two different loaves again without too much effort. But I wanted to get this video as a realistic view of making this starter from scratch and trying to get the, the loaf done. So they both look pretty much exactly the same. One has very much slightly more lift, which is the older starter. It's gone up a little bit more rather than out a little bit more. But Basically, they look the same. Uh, they've got a tight crumb. Again, that's from the overproofing and the overhandling to get them into shape. Uh, but it's, and it's a low hydration recipe. The higher hydration you are and the better, uh, you know, strength you put into your dough, the more likely you get those big uh, airy bubbles and things like that, which is why my baguettes and stuff have a fair amount of bubbles because it's a really high hydration dough, but I don't shape it. I just place it and that's, easier than trying to shape it into a ball. So they both looked basically the same. They both have a nice charring on the outside, but they both looked basically the same. They were perfectly edible. The kids ate them and we just chopped some of the, the, uh, the crumb off the, the, some of the burnt off the, the charcoal off the top. Uh, I also turned these into some uh, breadcrumbs that which has already come out I made mac and cheese and I use the uh, sourdough to make the breadcrumbs I love sourdough breadcrumbs they are so good in things like meatballs I I actually made sausage rolls I didn't think I don't think I filmed that when we had visitors I made sausage rolls for lunch and I used some of the breadcrumb some of the bread to make breadcrumbs for in the sausage rolls and they most of these things ask for panko crumbs and that's because they're a larger crumb they're nice and light and fluffy sourdough crumbs do a very similar thing uh they create lots of air and moisture within whatever you're cooking and it's really good uh so 
highly recommend sourdough breadcrumbs for any time you have some bread that you aren't using just crumb it up and stick it in the freezer and you can use it for that obviously we feed some to the animals if we have to but it's rare that we have leftover bread to be honest but every now and again or sometimes I purposely keep a couple of bagels like bagels make really nice breadcrumbs because they've got the everything bagel seasoning on top as well and anyway squirrel hey uh so that was me starting a starter from scratch baking on day seven eight uh as i said if there had have been a bit of a stall at day four it probably would have been baked about 10 day 10 because you would have had a couple of days of stall in the middle but it didn't have a stall i was hoping to show it but mine didn't have a stall uh probably because the weather is quite warm uh to be honest it, it's just been so warm that it, that's probably part and parcel of it so yeah that's how i start a starter from scratch and then maintain it from that point forward uh, i will try and do a sort of a follow-up video about how you know i put it in the fridge and then i use it and put it in the fridge and use it i have shown that in my everyday videos where i pull it in and out but generally speaking that week where i do the daily videos post groceries i don't make a lot of bread because we have so much to get through that it just isn't what i make a lot of flatbreads uh, but not a lot of um, uh, like rounds or uh, bagels or focaccias or anything like that because we've got a lot of food and prep to get through that it's just not high on the you know on the rotation of what we're doing but I will see how I go with that so any questions ask in the comments please ask away because I'm sure I haven't covered everything particularly in depth because I said it was a little bit of a hard concept to to do this on notes based on footage that i've already taken but any questions ask them in the comments i will try and cover them and we can go from there and hopefully this helps some people who were contemplating giving it a go and just weren't quite sure where to start it really is very simple it's just taking notice of doing it and doing it on a regular basis so thank you for watching everyone and i will see you next time bye guys